And for our last installment of the Not So Famous Americans, this book is called Lippman Pike, America's First Home Run King by Richard Michelson, illustrated by Zachary Pullen. And here's our title page and you'll see an illustration of an old newspaper from the 1850s. Lippman Pike hated to stand still. From behind the cash box, he shook out his left leg, then his right. The bell above the door jingled. Lip glanced toward his older brother, but Boaz was studying in the back room and didn't even look up. Good day, Mrs. Kaufman, Lip's father said. Mr. Pike was always polite. The neighbors called him a real gentleman. Good dog, Mrs. Kaufman said. She had met Lip's father years ago on the boat that had brought them to America from Holland. Sometimes she still spoke Dutch. My son is in need of... Lip leaped into action. It was 45 feet to the front window display, 90 feet round trip, exactly the distance between home plate and first base. Lip could run it in 14 seconds. He grabbed a package and, raised head da and raced head down. He heard fast-moving footsteps behind him and looked up in time to see Boaz slam a pair of boys' stockings on the counter. The best service in the city, Mr. Pike announced proudly. My boys could beat a racehorse in the home stretch. And you'll see in that newspaper that boys' stockings were 12 cents per pair. I finished my bar mitzvah homework, Boaz told his father, as he and Lip headed towards the door. Can we go watch men play bass? It seemed like everybody in Brooklyn was playing this exciting new game. Each neighborhood club had a team, and even some of the Jewish boys would practice batting and throwing when their parents weren't watching. Not my sons, Mrs. Pike complained to her husband. If grown lads chased after a leather ball in Europe, people would call them childish. Boaz is almost a man, and when Lip finishes his chores, he should exercise his mind. I won't let base interfere with the boy's education, Mr. Pike promised, promised his wife. But in America, even the smartest young men chase balls like silly boys. We want our children to fit in with their neighbors, not to live like foreigners in their birthplace. Some evenings after Mr. Pike locked the, sh locked the shop door, the boys would quickly dust the shelves and sweep the floors. Then Boaz would toss jawbreaker candies down the center aisle as Lip swung the broom handle and raced around the store. Now, three years later, and only seven days after his own bar mitzvah, Lip followed Boaz to a local junior club meeting. Sure, he's young and left-handed, Boaz told his teammates, but he's as fast as a racehorse and as strong as one, too. No one can outrun a racehorse, the team's captain said to Boaz. But if he's half as good as you, that's good enough for me. Lip was invited to join the junior club and play his first official amateur match. A couple of ladies in lawn chairs were picnicking in the park, and their young sons were climbing nearby trees. But Lip imagined that everybody in Brooklyn was preparing to watch the match. He felt butterflies rise in his stomach and his knees go weak. Don't worry, Boaz reassured his brother. In my first match, I didn't get a single hit. Lip wondered if that was supposed to make him feel better, but as he stepped up to the plate, he forgot all about being nervous, and he hit the first pitch, high over the right fielder's head. As the years passed, word of Lip's batting power and speed spread throughout Brooklyn, Customers were shop, would shop at the haberdashery just to talk about base. The store prospered. That's what good manners, fast service, and honor, honest prices will do, Mr. Pike told his wife. Of course, she answered. It helps that every lad in town wants to purchase his stockings from Lip. Now you heard that word haberdashery. That means a men's clothing store. When Lip turned 21, he told his parents he was moving to Philadelphia to play the, for the athletics. Mr. Pike was worried. Where will you work? He asked. Here, business is good. I can pay you $2 a day. You traveled halfway around the world to follow your dreams, Lip reminded him. 
There's nothing I love more than bass. Then Lip waved his parents closer and whispered, The athletics captain offered me $20 each week to play for his club. Mrs. Pike shook her head in disbelief. Who ever heard of anyone being paid to chase a ball? That year, the Athletics won 23 matches and only lost twice. In one match, Lip hit six home runs. He was their best player. But the other club members all came from the same hometown, and they began to grumble when it was rumored that Lip was being paid. It's unfair, the second baseman said. Who ever heard of a professional ball player? Only a working man should get wages. Besides... The left fielder added, I hear that Pike's a Jew. How can we trust him when we play against Brooklyn? Lip was voted off the team. But Lip refused to give up his dream. He joined the New Jersey Irvingtons until a man named Boss Tweed invited him to play closer to home. Lip was excited because the New York Mutuals were one of the best clubs in the league. Of course we can't. Pay you, Bostweed explained. That would be against baseball association policy, and as New York's commissioner of public works, I would never break the rules. He waved Lip closer so he could whisper. But I can offer you a job in our government office at Tammany Hall. You would have little work to do and plenty of time to play ball. All the best players are getting paid these days, Lip told his mother. He just arrived home after the season ended. The Eagle says there's going to be a professional league, Lip's father said. He waved the newspaper excitedly. Lip smiled. That is what I was about to tell you, he said. I was asked to be captain of the Troy Haymakers. Lip traveled to Troy to practice with his new teammates. Sure, we're all professionals, he heard one player whisper. But Lip grew up in Brooklyn, and I hear that he's a Jew. How can we be sure of his loyalty? How can we trust him when we play his old team in New York? On May 25, 1871, the Haymakers entered Brooklyn's Union grounds to play the heavily favored New York Mutuals. It seemed like everybody in the city had paid 50 cents to cheer for their team. 5,000 cranks were, crowded, were crowding into the ballpark. A thousand more fans lined up outside the fence. Only in America would people spend money to watch grown men chase after a ball, Mrs. Pike said to her husband as she settled onto the ladies' bench. Only in America, a familiar voice called out. It was Mrs. Kaufman waving from the next row. Good dog, Mrs. Pike, she said. This match I wouldn't miss for the world. Your Lippman is as fast as a racehorse and a real gentleman, just like his father. A reporter for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle was writing notes nearby. No one can outrun a racehorse, he yelled out, but if anyone could, it would be Lipman Pike. Lip looked out into the grandstand. He felt butterflies rise in his stomach, but as he stepped up to the plate, he forgot about being nervous, and he hit the first pitch high over the right fielder's head, and the crowd cheered. The rest is history. Lip had six hits that day, and the Haymakers won the match 25-10. to 10. By the end of the season, Lip tied for the league lead in home runs. The following year, Lip moved to Baltimore to join the Yellow Stockings. Once again, he led the league in home runs. On August 6, 1873, Lip proved that he could outrun a racehorse. 400 people paid 25 cents each and crowded into Newington Park in Baltimore to watch Lip beat a trotting horse named Clarence in a 100-yard sprint. In 1877, Lip, who had been nicknamed the Iron Batter, was hit his most famous home run when he st struck a ball nearly 360 feet with enough power that it bent a metal rod atop a 40-foot-high pagoda in deep center field of the Union grounds. That year, Lip again led the league in home runs. Lip retired in 1881 and opened a haberdashery in Brooklyn. He offered honest prices, fast service, and good manners. The store prospered. Everyone wanted to talk baseball and buy their stockings from Lip and Pike. 
Lip was 48 years old when he died of heart disease on October 10, 1893. His funeral was attended by politicians from Tammany Hall, old teammates, many fans, and friends from Brooklyn's Jewish community. The Sporting News noted that Lip Pike was one of baseball's greatest sluggers and one of baseball and of and one of the baseball players who was always gentlemanly both on and off the field.